I stood upon the sand of the sea and saw a beast rise up, rise up, rise up. Good evening, everybody, and welcome once again to the Midnight Ride. My name is David Carey Cole, and it is my great privilege once again to welcome each and every one of you into the Puritan Barn for the Midnight Ride with myself and John Pounders. Tonight, the bloodline of Lucifer, Halel ben Shahar. We're going to be revisiting the story of Lucifer, and we're going to be adding in a lot of information that I bet you've not heard anywhere else before. And it's such a blessed time as we come together in this time of the Passover and the Feast of Unleavened Bread, how blessed we are and how thankful we are for all the blessings that the Lord has given us when we come to this time where we remember that time of the the great victory for the Israel of God of that first Passover, looking forward to that time when Jesus Christ would be the Lamb that takes away the sin of the world. How blessed we are to be able to celebrate this great time of the Passover and Feast of Unleavened Bread. So happy Passover and Feast of Unleavened Bread to each and every one of you. And get ready because the celebration starts right now because we are now live, live, live. What's up, riders? You guys are awesome. I w- I'm so glad you guys are here. We're glad to be here. Let me know where you guys are from in the chat. We love to hear that. This is one of one of our favorite things to see how many people we have all over the world. I see Slovakia, Michigan, Texas, Glasgow, Scotland. I see all over the place right now in the chat. Pretty awesome. And even so, some people from the nation of Kentucky. Even people from the nation of Kentucky, even some of them backwood Hoosiers like ourselves. You guys are all here, so we're thankful for that. And, you know, David, it's been a pretty good week. Like you said, Passover. Uh, unleavened bread, one of the great times of the year that has a lot of meaning for sure. Your heart just has to rejoice when you just meditate on the goodness of God and the great victory. You know, it's a time of victory. You know, it was a time of real, uh, I mean, it was a tense time when they were there in their homes with the death angel passing through, but it's a time of victory and deliverance, and that's what it is for God's people. It's a time of spiritual refreshing and joy. It's the celebration of God's feast. It's a marvelous thing. There's nothing any better. Yeah. Nothing any better. It's such a blessing from the Father. And times are so similar, you know. I mean, maybe not in 100% the same way, but the same old tricks by the same principalities. You've got the genocide. You've got the dumbing down. You've got the poverty. You've got all of these things that they're just trying so hard to weigh down on the people, you know. And um, same tricks, just a different day, you know. Yeah. And, and it's all about escaping that mentality, escaping that weakness of Babylon. And tonight it's going to be awesome because you talk a lot about uh, this because it does have a lot to do with what we're talking about tonight. So it absolutely does. It's a very, very appropriate lesson. And, um, it, you know, it, it's just a wonderful time to serve the Lord. And, you know, there's so many things that people are concerned about, and rightly so. And you just think what it would have been like there on that first Passover to be there and, uh, when the death angel was passing through, it, it was really something. It yeah. was a, just an awesome deliverance. And that's uh, the same God we serve now that's going to deliver us in the, in these times. We serve the same living God of the first Passover. That's for sure. And we want to give a shout out to our sponsors tonight. Uh, normally, Joshua Watts Leather Company, Company is a sponsor, but he is actually not going to be taking any orders until the fall. So he's done taking orders right now. He's got a lot going on in his plate. So but we, but we still love Joshua Watts Leather Company, and hopefully you order something when, in the fall from him. 
We also want to thank nystv.org. You can go there and get your first month free with the coupon code Rider. You can check out Book of Enoch video commentary that me and David are going through. David's leading us through the entire Book of Enoch. We also have mm-hmm. documentaries. Uh, we have shows that have been banned from YouTube, too hot for YouTube, and just stuff in general that we can't really air on the Luciferian system out there. So make sure you check that out. Also, Sugar and Spice Soap Company natural soaps natural lotions different things on your, that you can put on your body with ease and not worry about all the toxic stuff that uh is basically the world's trying to push into your body so we're thankful for all those links are in the description with that being said david it's time for the ride so let's it's get it. time for the ride let's get to work and the bloodline of lucifer halal ben shahar and something that has been kind of a distinctive of FOJC radio for many years that we've said a lot of things that no one else has said. And for years we have, we have maintained and taught that Lucifer and Satan are not the same entity, which goes against the party line of churchianity, which we uh, butcher that sacred cow very, very often in many of them. And the first time that I worked with John in a public setting was in the Exposing the Darkness Conference in Evansville in 2016, and uh, we had just begun the Midnight Ride a little bit before that, just a few months, I believe, and uh, we just had started calling it the Midnight Ride, and at that uh, conference, my presentation was Lucifer, the Son of Satan, I believe was the title of it. I think it's still probably up on Now You See TV YouTube, and since that time, uh, We've learned a little more. We've studied a little more. So we're going to revisit that topic tonight with some more insight that I believe is going to be a blessing for all of you. In 2 Corinthians chapter 13 and verse 1, Paul is quoting the Torah when he says, This is the third time I am coming to you. In the mouth of two or three witnesses shall every word be established. And it's a strange thing when I will teach that Lucifer and Satan are not the same, that people will immediately uh, get kind of a knee-jerk reaction. Well, you're some kind of a false teacher. We all know that. And there is not one single scripture in the Word of God that says that Lucifer and the Satan are the same entity. Not one. And I always say you're much better off teaching what's in the Bible than what's not in the Bible. And it's amazing, so many of the doctrines that modern American Christians want to argue about, they not only don't have two or three, they don't have a single scripture. And they have doctrines who you can't even find the name of it in the Word of God. I could give many examples for that, as we have. But this is yet another. And what we're going to do tonight, we're going to stand upon the Word of God, and we're going to teach what's in the Bible instead of what's not in the Bible, and I bet we'll do much better. Now, in Isaiah chapter 14 and verse 4, and in the great 14th chapter of the prophet Isaiah, this is the chapter that addresses not only Lucifer, but also the Assyrian. And tonight, our focus will be upon Lucifer. And in Isaiah 14 and 4, thou shalt take up this proverb, against the king of Babylon, and say, How hath the oppressor seeth the golden city ceased? And I'll read the comment from John Gill in his commentary on the Bible. And John Gill says this. He says, This is not to be understood of the fall of Satan and the apostate angels from their first estate, when they were cast down from heaven to hell, though there may be an allusion to it, but the words are a continuation of the speech of the dead to the king of Babylon. And the word of God clearly says that this text is addressed to the king of Babylon. Now, in the date of Isaiah the prophet, It is 745 B.C. This is almost 200 years before Nebuchadnezzar came and destroyed Jerusalem in 586 B.C. So it's not talking about Nebuchadnezzar, and most likely the king of Babylon that's being addressed is 
Nimrod. And we're going to see an amazing passage here in the first part of Isaiah 14 where we see a former king of Babylon literally descending into hell and being greeted by the kings of the dead. And most likely, that king of Babylon that's being addressed there is Nimrod. And it says here also in this text in Isaiah 14 and 4, it says, Thou shalt take up this proverb. Now that Hebrew word translated proverb in Isaiah 14 and 4, this is also translated other places as a proverb, as a proverb or as a, uh, not a similitude, gosh, I can't think of the name, the, um, gosh, I'm having a, a, a brain wheezy. <laughs> <laughs> Me too, I think. Uh, the, uh, but all of the uh, parallels, parables, parables, parables gosh, there. parables. And what a parable is, I had a Biden moment there. <laughs> but what a parable is, it's a it's a story, the proverb and the parable, it's a story that compares something to something else. And in the uh, study, we studied Ezekiel 28 not long ago on FOJC Radio. We've been doing a series called The Structure of the Satanic Kingdom. And in Isaiah 20, Ezekiel 28, there's the king of Tyrus and there's the prince of Tyrus. You have the spiritual power behind the earthly power. And here in Isaiah 14, we have a proverb or a parable that is showing us the spiritual power behind the physical king and behind the throne of Babylon, which is the ground zero of the building of the satanic kingdom. Behind the throne of Babylon, we're going to learn the entity that puts the coal on the fire, and that entity is Lucifer. So it's very important that we learn what we can know about this. Now, in Isaiah chapter 14, let's read verses 9 through 11. And this is the text that was referred to by Brother Gill in his commentary. And here, this is addressed to the king of Babylon. And Nimrod lived several hundreds of years before this, but this is the address. Hell from beneath is moved for thee to meet thee at thy coming. It stirreth up the dead for thee, the dead, the Rephaim in the heart of the earth, even all the chief ones of the earth. It hath raised up from their thrones all the kings of the nations, and they shall speak and say unto thee, Art thou also become weak as we? Art thou become like unto us? Thy pomp is brought down to the grave, and the noise of thy vials. The worm is spread under thee, and the worms cover thee. And this is a text and a concept that we spoke about when we talked about the kings in the heart of the earth, and we've addressed this on previous Midnight Rides. Now, in the biblical illustrator, the comment is spot on. It says in verses 9 through 11, he accompanies the thought of the shade of the king of Babylon as it journeys to the underworld and imagines the ironical greeting with which there meets it from the lips of the other kings. So here we see Nimrod being reunited with the other Gibberim kings in the heart of the earth. Now, In the word biblical commentary, I gave the wrong scripture there, didn't I? What what is that supposed to be? That okay, idea? that should be. Yeah, we've got a Isaiah fourteen twelve, and Isaiah fourteen twelve. That's the scripture that we're all so familiar with. How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? How art thou brought down to the ground, which didst weaken the nations, Isaiah chapter 14 and verse 12. And there are many out there, and this seems to be a trend in some of the uh, apostate Hebrew root Bibles. And uh, how many of the Hebrew root Bibles are apostate? All of them. And in many of them, they want to do away with the personality of Lucifer. And how nice it would be if that were so. 
And they, they want to say that there is not an actual entity being addressed here. But in each and every one of the pre-King James Texas Receptus Bibles, the Matthews Bible, the Bishop's Bible, the Geneva Bible, also in the Septuagint, all of these were thoroughly in agreement that we have an entity here, that Lucifer, just like it is in the King James, capital L, U. C-I-F-E-R, Lucifer. You know, it's a shame, isn't it, that you could go to um, a drunk in the tavern. They would know Lucifer's a real person. Yeah, sure, we know that. But uh, a lot of these bright lights that are filling pulpits, uh, they want to deny that. Now, in the Word Biblical Commentary, the comment on Isaiah 14, 12, How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, Son of the morning, and literally in the Hebrew, that's the title of our lesson, Hallel ben Shahar. And when I was studying this out many years ago, and I would just go through the Bible verse by verse, and when I come to that, it spoke about Lucifer's father. And I, you know, he is the son of Hallel ben Shahar. And, you know, angels don't have daddies. When, when the father made the angels, he didn't make a daddy angel and a mommy angel to make little angels. But each and every angel was made individually. So Lucifer right there is eliminated of being an angel. So we're going to study and we're going to determine just exactly what Lucifer was. And in the word biblical commentary, it says Shahar is known as a god's name and this was a well-known name of a pagan god that was worshiped in the levant when joshua brought the children of israel into the promised land it, it was a pagan deity it was known it was worshiped you can confirm this from numerous sources that when it says that lucifer is the son of the morning the morning is literally Hallel ben shahar which is the name of a god and that would make lucifer Lucifer a Nephilim, and this absolutely is confirmed by the traditions of Lucifer from the, the documents at Ugarit. It goes on to say, in the Old Testament, Psalms 139.9 speaks of his wings. Job 33.9.41.18, his eyelashes are raised, and there are other references too that we could give. Now, many, many times, when we study the Bible, and this is why we have rejected flat earth cosmology, when we believe the Bible says that uh, the earth is stationary and the sun is moving, we're silly enough to believe that. You mean we rejected globe theology, not flat earth theology? Oh, yeah. I'm sorry. Did yeah. I say that? Well, yeah, just, just to clarify. Well, just we in case better somebody, clarify yeah. that. <laughs> I seem to want to get my tongue over my tooth tonight, so we better clarify that. Yeah, we have rejected the globe theology for what the Bible says, and we believe what the Bible says. And here's another place where the Bible clearly says that Lucifer has a father, and this father was a pagan god, and we look to Scripture, and just like the word biblical commentary says, we can see places where this god is addressed and spoken of. And we'll see here that in the basic story of Lucifer, it's not the story, as we're told, of Satan being cast out of heaven. This isn't the story at all that we read of Lucifer in Isaiah 14. We read the story of Lucifer who wanted to ascend into heaven. He started on earth and wanted to ascend into heaven, and then he got smacked back down. So it's not the story of someone that started off up there and got thrown out, but it's the story of someone that started on the earth, wanted to ascend, and got smacked back down. And you can just see that from a quick reading. It is, we're not being told the truth about this passage like we are of so many things. Now, let's read the text here in Psalm 139, beginning in verse 7. Whither shall I go from thy spirit? Or whither shall I flee from thy presence? If I ascend up into heaven, thou art there. If I make my bed in hell, behold, thou art there. If I take the wings of the morning. Now there's our word there again, shahar. If, and literally, if I would take the wings of this, this being and dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea, then 
the Lord would still find him. Now, in this passage, we can see David is comparing a hypothetical ascent that he could make to the actual ascent that Shahar one time made. So we see here in the scripture, it's intimated that before Lucifer ascended into heaven, his father did that before him. And after Lucifer, we have the first one was Shahar, the second one was his son Lucifer, and then there was another attempt, and that attempt was with Nimrod. And in Nimrod and the story of the Tower of Babel in Genesis chapter 11, this is absolutely the story of trying to ascend back up into the third heaven. And in the book of Jasher, this scripture just blows my mind. I love it. In Jasher chapter 9 and verse 25, it speaks of the actual intent that Nimrod had to actually enter into the third heaven and storm the throne room of God. Now it's dumb and then there's dumber, but that's exactly what this text says, and this is exactly what took place there. This was nothing less than the intent. The first one to try to ascend was Shahar, Lucifer's father. Lucifer carried on the family tradition. We have then Jasher in uh, Nimrod, Jasher 9.25, and the building of the tower was to them a transgression and a sin. And they began to build it, and while they were building against the Lord God of heaven. Now that's what people are doing today. They are building against the Lord God of heaven with their nonsense at CERN and all the other demonic nonsense that they're coming up with. They imagined in their hearts to war against him and to ascend into heaven. That's amazing. That's mm -hmm. just amazing. But this text in the book of Jasher, that captures the heart of the entire conspiracy behind the Tower of Babel episode, and it shows it to be a continuation of what Shahar and Lucifer did, and that plan is still underway today. Nothing less than entering into the throne room and overthrowing God, and they are so arrogant, and they are so full of themselves and the devil that they actually believe that they can do that. It's amazing. You know, all of these scriptures, of course, you did this show, I guess it was two weeks ago, Cosmic Boogie Woogie, where it talked about the nature of the stars, all of that, and you're going to talk a little bit more about that, I know, here continually. But the story, the story played out, you know, I think like Tertullian, all those people believed the same way we believed that this interpretation of Shahar would be talking about, you know, the morning star like Venus, right? The Venus, the Venu Venusian cult, this is, this is like a, almost every god uh, is kind of faltered after, I guess, son of god type mythology where there'd be Mithraism is this yeah. this uh morning star that tries to ascend above every single day it's always trying to ascend over and over and over again in a pattern yeah. that keeps going yeah and uh it's just amazing when you see that story played out that astro story played out in the scripture as well as in real life and and that just goes to show you the that when the bible says you know the stars cry out knowledge and and they speak and everything everything happens in the stars like that, it's pretty amazing to see this play out in real form and to know that these stars aren't just a star like we think of today, but they're, they are literal beings that are up there yeah, trying to ascend and trying to do different things. So anyways, yeah. I know you Yeah, it is. And this is something you spoke to a lot in a presentation yeah. about how the movements of the planet Venus was uh, such a big part of yeah. Luciferian worship wow. and of secret societies. Huge. And we're going to connect some of those dots here too in this presentation today. Yeah. But it is so, it's such an important uh, concept that is so often overlooked about the actual knowledge we can obtain, not from a, a str astrological, but from an astronomical point of view. Yeah. Uh, it, it is really, uh, it's really something. And we're going to be getting into that in some of the actual, uh, how much, of the doctrine of Luciferianism and the secret societies is taken right from the movements of Venus. And uh, it, it's amazing. Yeah. Now in Job chapter 41 and 18, it says, and this Job chapter 41 is speaking about Leviathan. And here in Job 41, 
and 18, it says, By his kneesings a light doth shine, and his eyes are like the eyelids of the morning. Now, there's our word there, yeah. shahar. And all you got to do, and you see, that's the way the word of God is written. There's truth and inspiration in the English. There's truth and inspiration in the Greek and the Hebrew and the Aramaic. And we absolutely, there's a lot of people out there do not believe in studying the Hebrew, the Greek, and Aramaic words that God gave. That's silly because God did not breathe out English words. He breathed out Hebrew, Greek, and Aramaic words. It's absolutely a good thing to study the word God gave. It's also a good thing to understand that there's inspiration and there's preservation. Not God not only inspired his word, but he also preserved it. So we do not want to uh, do as some do. Some people speak in other tongues and some people lie in other tongues and they'll try to use the Greek and the Hebrew to overthrow the clear meaning of the text. You'll never come to truth like that. But here in Job 41 and 18, the morning is once again Shahar, the father of Lucifer. And here it's comparing the eyes are like the eyelids of the morning. In other words, a comparison is being made between the eyes of Leviathan and the eyelids of Shahar. I think we might have a little family resemblance here going on, yeah. as Hank Jr. used to <laughs> sing about. Yeah, a little old family resemblance yeah. is what we got going on. And it is, and we're going to show that because we're talking about the bloodline, and we're not just going to establish who Lucifer is, but we're going to trace that bloodline and we're going to understand how it first in, uh, implanted itself in the earth and how it went on to spread from there and how we can identify that. Now, once again, from the word biblical commentary, we'll read another comment. It says here, a Ugardic text, Shahar and Shalem, portrays El's fathering Shahar and also his birth by one of El's wives. He is seen as parallel to Shalem, the god of twilight. In Ugarit, Shahar is also found in personal names. And this is exactly uh, the, the, way that, uh, the, the way it is. And we can see that all, all of the pagan pantheons, it's all the Genesis 6 scenario. It's such a shame that most of the Bible schools and almost 90% plus of the pulpits in America and all over the world, they will not deal with the Genesis 6 scenario. And by rejecting that, there is just so much of the Word of God you're never going to understand. You're just not going to get it if you reject this. And this is just one of the places... And it's always, it's just sexual promiscuity. The gods having sex with one another, bringing forth the brood. And this is exactly how we are to understand Lucifer, not as a fallen angel, but he is one of the Nephilim that was brought forth, and he was probably a first-generation Nephilim. And in reality, Lucifer was probably two to three hundred feet tall. He was a huge monster. In the Word of God, it talks about the, the Amorites that were tall as cedars. They were big. And it's much like I remember there was a series of movies called Clash of the Titans. Mm. And in this, it would picture them literally this big. And I think this is an accurate presentation of how big those first and second generation Nephilim were. Yeah. And, uh, you know, the New Age and uh, the Freemasons, they want to tell you that Lucifer is, uh, he's the light bringer. He'll give you the light. He's just wonderful, you know. But uh, he was a monster. You know, he was a cannibalistic monster that uh, it, it was just horrible beyond description. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's the real truth about who Lucifer was. Now, in Isaiah chapter 14, going down here to verses 13 and 14, for thou hast said in thine heart, and this is still addressing Lucifer, I will ascend into heaven. So clearly here, we have an entity that's on earth wanting to ascend into heaven, not an entity in heaven being kicked out. It's just plain as day. I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt 
my throne above the stars of God. Lucifer had a throne. I will sit also upon the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north. He wanted to literally ascend upon a mountain. And this is literally, we're going to show you that this was the Temple Mount right there in Jerusalem. And we're going to address this and the exact area where Lucifer's throne was. We're going to give you the time period of that and how that sequences with what's spoken of in Isaiah 14, the last part of the chapter with the Assyrian, as we have studied that and synchronized that with the 31st chapter of the book of Ezekiel. And in verse 14, I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the Most High. Yeah, he can just walk his little self right up into the throne room. But he found out that he could not do that. And he run into a lot of trouble. Now, I want to read something from a book entitled The Realm of the Ring Lords. And we're going to see as we make other comparisons that it was at the time of Six Day Man when the when men first to begin to multiply upon the earth on the sixth day of creation and another subject that we're not going to go into tonight we've talked about this recently in a series on FOJC radio on the mysteries of creation how that uh, i think maybe the genesis projects what we called it sister donna could tell you and by the way happy birthday sister donna she got to hold our great grandbaby for the first time our first great grandbaby wow. today so happy birthday she'll probably be posting that picture but this we talked about how that genesis chapter one and verse and chapter two that they are not concurrent they're sequential but that's another story. But this is something you might want to get up to speed on if you have never studied that. That's another thing that we're not being told the truth about. Now, from this book by Lawrence Gardner, Realm of the Ring Lords, this will help us to understand the actual uh, bloodline of Lucifer. Now, I think before I read this, I want to read uh, Isaiah 14, 21. And in Isaiah 14, 21, it establishes the fact scripturally that Lucifer was a breeder. In Isaiah 14 and 21, prepare slaughter for his children, for the iniquity of their fathers, that they do not rise, nor possess the land, nor fill the face of the world with cities. This was considered such a serious thing to the father that he absolutely put a lid on this. Just like he stopped the Tower of Babel with the dispersion of languages, here we see the father interceding that the children of Lucifer would not be able to establish cities on the face of the earth. And by the way, these cities that have been established on the face of the earth now, have you been seeing a few problems with it? You know, if you have, just wave your hand. Yeah, yeah, I see that hand. The Luciferian agenda is being fulfilled in the great cities of the world right now. Now, in John Oswald's commentary, and this will set up what I'll read from Mr. Gardner, but in John Oswald's commentary, on uh, the book of Isaiah, and this reflects what John said just a few moments ago. And Mr. Oswalt says this, Daystar, son of the morning, reflects the likelihood that Hillel ben Shahar refers to the planet Venus, which never reaches the zenith before the sun rises and apparently extingu extinguishes this. And it says it is associated in Canaanite mythology with the, Gad, the god Athar and also with Lucifer. Now, when we see the association of Lucifer with the planet Venus, everybody knows the planet Venus is the goddess. Yeah. And this is why we've also taught and maintained that Lucifer is Lucy in the sky with diamonds. Lucifer is female. And Lucifer is the worship of the goddess. Now, this has been very well concealed, hasn't it? And the things that are the most important for us to understand, the devil would be so happy for us to just say, oh, yeah, Lucifer, that's just Satan. And when you do that, you close your mind off immediately to understanding the deeper things of God and actually putting your finger right upon 
what actually took place here and how this bloodline has been continued down to this day. And in Lawrence Gardner, who is a fellow that we've referred to several times on several midnight rides, this guy had an elite pedigree and he had access to the private libraries in Europe and also to exclusive uh, European Masonic libraries. And his actual uh, part of his title was uh, the a fellow of the Society of Antiqu An Antiquities. And I mean, this guy, uh, he's got a Masonic pedigree uh, that's very impressive. But this is what he says. In other words, this is a fellow that was in a position to know a lot of things that your average person wouldn't. And we're at the place now where these occultists, they are now coming right out and saying things that in years before they wouldn't say. And why are they doing it? Well, why shouldn't they do it? Who's going to stand up against them? Who's going to stand up and say this is wrong? Even Freemasonry, which I do not want to minimize the danger and the evil of Freemasonry, but how many of these bright lights that are going to stand up in the pulpit and do their little pagan Easter tata. -ta. how many of them has the gonies to stand up and say Freemasonry is wrong? And I guarantee you the line will be a real short one and probably totally non-existent. Paganism has taken over the 501c3 American church, whether it's Freemasonry or whether it's their pagan holidays, they have taken it over run for your life. In what Mr. Gardner said, and this is on page 118, A Realm of the Ring Lords, he says the original starfire nectar of Mesopotamia was fed to the kings of the early grail bloodline. The minstrel flower was designated flower, customarily represented as a lily or lotus, and she was the bulb, the storage organ, or the biblical rose of the essential essence. And excuse me, this is gross, but this is, I mean, we need to know. It says, menstruum contains the most valuable endocrine secretions. And that's what these people believe. And they literally believe that by drinking this blood, that they would receive the purity of the bloodline and the most, uh, the most, the female can considered to be the most pure bloodline, that would be the high priest of the cult. Now, this goes back thousands of years, and this goes back to the worship of the goddess who is Lucifer, Venus, and this worship of the bloodline and of the false communion and of the drinking. And, you know, this is just Crowley and Satanism. You can read from the books of Aleister Crowley how they did this very thing. This is Abramovich and the spirit cooking of all the elites. They want to get together and they want to eat and drink this stuff that's the most disgusting of the human bodily emissions. This is the worship and the propagation of the bloodline of Lucifer. It's here now. It's real. We need to be able to identify it, and these are the people that are now running the world and running our nation. I believe unequivocally that they are blood-drinking evil. They want to do no less than destroy our nation and to put in a one-party state, no less than that. And this is exactly is what we are in the middle of. We are in the middle not only of a Luciferian takeover of our nation, but of the entire world, and it is rolling down the hill very, very fast. You know, it's it's so interesting because that that's so true in the dominion, the way it works too. Like God gave humans dominion, right? Yeah. And you see, however, this other thing taking over all of the nations of the world. And it's so interesting because they do it through influence, right? They don't they don't make anybody do anything. They influence these leaders of the world and their and their children who they put in power throughout this thing. But interestingly, just really quickly, what you were talking about this and the breeder aspect of Lucifer, you know, it's explained in, mm -hmm. in even in mythology, in Greek mythology, Roman mythology, because Venus and Aphrodite are the same being, you know, Roman mythology, it's Aphrodite, Greek, Venus and and so forth. The same woman uh, also had a child uh, named Ionius, something like that. It's like A-N-I-A-N-I-A-S, -A 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 
A E N E A S. So however you pronounce that. And Aphrodite. Inanna, there you go. See, you ever need help yeah. pronouncing words, John? Yeah. Just call on hey, them right just, here. Just, I can pronounce them words. Okay, I can that one. Inanna. Okay, Inanna. <laughs> so, so the, according to the mythology, Aphrodite is responsible for tempting all of the angels, the, the gods, according to their for coming to coming down and having relations with women, and that form all of these bloodlines and gods. It's really interesting. And it, what a fitting time to talk about this because Venus and Easter are completely one and the same. Yeah. You know, it's really it's yeah. really crazy. So yeah. yeah, and this is such a blessed time, and it is so appropriate. Like John says, this is the time when we refuse to worship that goddess, mm -hmm. and that's what you're doing if you're going into that 501c3 church for your little Easter sunrise service. That's what you're doing. That is paganism. That's rank paganism. And if you're doing it, you need to repent. It's not something that we wonder if it's right or not. That's wrong. That's idolatry. That's paganism. Now, Mr. Uh, Gardner goes on to say this. He says, uh, the Starfire maidens who produce the menstrual rasa, the designated vehicle of light, the lunar essence and this is what they believed and this is how they received their spiritual experiences now get this now it's quiz time on the midnight ride how many this week watched the video about the jab coming from snake venom if you did just raise your hand yeah i see that hand yeah yeah you saw it didn't you you're, you're we're up on we, we've got the most intelligent listening audience uh, in the world right here on the Midnight Ride. I see those hands. Thank you very much. Now listen to this. This is what Mr. Gardner said concerning uh, this uh, spirit fire. He said, uh, the lunar essence was rich in endocrinal secretions such as melatonin and serotonin, and it says that it was supplemented. It says uh, that the supplements are obtained from the desiccated glands of dead animals. And even back then, they would take the glands of dead animals to mix into the little brew. Mm. And this is exactly what we see going on right now. And it's the Luciferian bloodline. It's exactly what it is. Nothing less than that. Now, on one more thing here, we're going to tie in on the bloodline of Lucifer. And, you know, we're also, we're the crazy people. We talk about Tartaria. We've probably done a half a dozen shows about Tartaria, and um, we might have to do some more. But in on page 68, what Mr. Gardner says about Tartaria, he said, he says here, Tartaria, which sits on the Maros River, 70 miles south of the Transylvanian city of Kaju. And he says that the people of Tartaria, and in Tartaria, this takes in the entire area from Ukraine all the way to the coast, all of China, North Korea, even the, the west coast of the United States. But it says here the people of the Tartaria region were the prognigators of many aspects of the emergent Sumerian culture, even of their original concept of tribal kingship. And we talked about this, and we've talked about how the language of Tartaria, it was a thousand years ahead of the Sumerians. Many people think the Sumerians was the oldest uh, civilization on earth, but that is just not the fact. It goes on to say, and this is where it started, you know, and we've talked a lot in recent broadcasts about how the only way to understand the geopolitical situation of what's going on today is understanding that the things upon this earth, the kings of the nations, that they are being moved and they're being motivated like pieces on a chessboard by these ancient entities and we're seeing the literally the rise of Gog which we also addressed in a complete midnight ride but this is what Mr. Gardner says on page 70 here he said the main settlement of the sky god Anu was not in Sumer where one might expect to find it but hundreds of miles north of the Caspian Sea and it says 
denoting a migration route from the Black Sea country down into the Delta Plains of the Sumerian Eden. And this is something that has become increasingly acceptable. The more that people study the ancient migrations of these ancient peoples and the way that languages have developed, that absolutely Tartaria was ahead of Sumer by a thousand years anyway. So we can see the beginning of this bloodline all the way back to Tartaria, which is what we have emphasized and it is so important to understand the, the, who Gog is and the understanding Gog is in G-O-G and the rise of Gog and what we're seeing take place right now in this situation in Ukraine. Now, also, something here I'll read from the biblical illustrator. It had another really good comment here, and it says, Lucifer, in his splendor, the king of Babylon is likened to the morning star, which was worshipped by the Babylonians under the name Ishtar. And this is exactly what John said, Ishtar, Easter, Anana, Lucy in the sky with diamonds, the Virgin Mary, it's all the goddess, Ashtoreth, take your pick. It is all different names of the ancient worship of Lucifer that has continued to establish this bloodline down through the centuries as in even now is control of the Luciferian takeover of the entire world to implement the one world order and the one world religion and it will be the Luciferian false communion I guarantee you that's where it's headed and uh, it, it's coming at us so fast that I think you just have to be deaf dumb and blind not to see it now one more thing to add sure to you about, go right ahead, you're talking John. about the snake venom and we did a show on Omicron a few months ago I, I don't know how many months ago but uh, we talked about because there was an alignment that happened, which was a um, an actual eclipse that happened on on the day, and I can't remember the name of the day, but it was literally like the day of we the day we did the show, and the these people such as Klaus Schwab, his name's been real popular lately. At the time, no, not many people really knew much about him, but World Economic Forum leader Klaus Schwab, um, uh, the name the name is escaping me right now, but the the leader of like the Ripple XRP, all of the people that are basically all about changing the world currency to to crypto and and that kind of technology, they took icebreakers and ships and all kinds of stuff down to Antarctica to observe this thing that happened underneath Ophiuchus. Now Ophiuchus and Venus, Venus is in Ophiuchus, and it represents the two sides of, sides of love. Ophiuchus is a what created a potion to heal people with cobra venom and gorgonite blood. And so it's interesting how it all is starting to kind of come together a little bit more, but this was stuff that they showed us in the, in the signs through through the vac through the the virus everything was it was it's all plays out cuz it's an astrological event. It's really interesting. Uh, and know. all these billionaires say, we got to get our little selves down to Antarctica. We don't want to miss this. Yeah. Now, that, you know, yeah. really? Yeah. And the, the uh, Ophiuchus, mm -hmm. as you said, which is where we would locate Venus mm -hmm. in the heavenlies, the ancient snake worshipers were called the Ophites. Yeah. And the Ophite snake worshiper cults. Yeah. And this is what the snake worshipers were called from the most remote antiquity antiquity the Ophites yeah yep. now let's say a couple more things here about the actual movement of the planet Venus and how just the movements of this planet in the heavens has so much to do with uh, the the occult and with Freemasonry and Satanism and all things evil but this is a book called the book of Hiram and this is written by another 33rd degree British Freemason uh, Christopher Knight and also Robert Lomas, another British Freemason. And on page 42, it says this about the planet Venus. It says, against the background of the zodiac, Venus completes a five pointed star shape every eight years and returns to its precise starting place after 40 years. And this is why the pentagram is held as one of the highest icons of the black arts because uh, it, it'll literally draw 
in, in the movements, it will draw a five-pointed star in its heavenly movements. And that's why the pentagram, this is why this is the blazing star in Freemasonry. And they're raised every time you ask a Freemason, what is it that you most desire when the, uh, when the uh, Freemason is going through the, the, the initiation? He always says, light. What is it you desire? More light. And it's not the light of Jesus Christ. It's the light of Lucifer. As Albert Pike said on page 321 of Morals and Dogma, Lucifer, the light bearer. Mr. Knight and Lomas, they go on to say, as Venus first appears, its light will be red. And this is why the color red has been associated with Satan. It's because of the planet Venus. He goes on to say, this is on page 157 from this book, it says the planet Venus, as she moves around the sky, touches the path of the sun in just five places. And this is where we see the five points of fellowship. In Freemasonry, in the third degree of the Master Mason, when he is raised, he is raised upon the five points of fellowship. And then the master whispers the secret word of Freemasonry in the initiate's ear, Maha Bone. And that literally means the phallus of Osiris. And uh, you ought to be real proud of that. No wonder they don't want people to know what that is. Some of the, uh, the good church people might get offended at them if they really knew that, wouldn't they? But this is also the five points of fellowship in the great white of witchcraft, which is actually a rite of cohabitation between the high priestess and the, the head of the coven. But so much of the things that come from the occult, they're drawn from this primary source of the movement of the planet Venus. And this is all a part of that Luciferian worship. It's a part of the Luciferian bloodline. And while witchcraft and Freemasonry might seem unrelated, and in some ways they are, it is all the same worship. It is the same worship that is driving us forward to this one world order and this one world religion that we are right in the middle of. Now, we're going to go to the book of Job, and we're going to look here at chapter 8, verses, uh, chapter 38, verses 4 through 7, and we're going to get an even clearer picture of just who Shahar was, what he did, and of what's coming. And we addressed this real recently, just a couple weeks ago, in our midnight ride on the Cosmic Boogie Woogie. But in Job 38, beginning in verse 4, Where wast thou? When I laid the foundations of the earth, declare, if thou hast understanding, who hath laid the measures thereof, if thou knowest, or who hath stretched the line upon it? Whereupon are the foundations thereof fastened, or who laid the cornerstone thereof, when the morning stars sang together, and all the sons of God shouted for joy. Now, there's just a lot of things that we can learn from this text. One, that when the foundation of the earth was laid, at that time the rebellion uh, had not taken place. And here again, uh, if you would listen to the study on FOJC, the Mysteries of Creation, we really went into that in a lot of detail there. But here we see the Bible speaking about the morning stars. And we can determine from the scripture and from the book of Enoch just who these morning stars were. And in the book of Enoch, chapter 80 and verse 1, And in those days the angel Uriel answered and said unto me, Behold, I have shown thee everything, Enoch, and I have revealed everything to thee, that thou shouldest see the sun and this moon and the leaders of the stars of the heaven, and all those who turned them, their tasks and times and departures. And from a study of the Bible and from the book of Enoch, we learn that what we see when we look up are actually entities, angels, good and bad, and that there are actually also physical objects up there that are being moved by angels. And here it speaks of the leaders of the stars who turn the sun and the moon. And literally, when we have the morning stars, 
These are the angels that actually would move the sun and cause sunrise to, to take place. And Shahar was perhaps the leader of the morning stars that would literally cause the morning to take place from moving the sun. And this is exactly what we see here in Enoch chapter 80. And we went into a lot more detail on a lot more scriptures that talked about the, the intricacies of this in what we call the cosmic boogie woogie. Now, back to the Word of God in Job chapter 38, verse 12 and verse 13. Hast thou commanded the morning since thy days, and cause the day spring to know his place. Now look that word day spring up. This is the word shahar. And here the father is saying, hast thou commanded the morning? Have you made the sun to rise and cause the day spring shahar to know his place? And literally the word speaks here of a time when the father put shahar in his place. And it also speaks of it a time of the judgment of the wicked, that it may take hold of the ends of the earth, that the wicked might be shaken out of it. Now, I want to read the comment on that text from Joseph Carl, one of my favorite Puritan commentators, and oh boy, does he nail it on, in his comment on this text in the book of Job. And he says, Dayspring is expressed by a different word in the original from the morning light. Absolutely right. The dayspring is the translation of Shahar, Lucifer's father. He goes on to say, It implies the first of the morning. The Lord speaks here of the dayspring as if it were a rational creature. Amen. <laughs> the Lord speaks here of the dayspring as if it were a rational creature that took instructions or a word of direction where to begin the morning light. Thank you, Brother Carl. You nailed it. This is exactly what we see in this text in the book of Job. We see the father speaking of a time when he put Shahar in his place and of addressing Shahar just like he is as a rational creature that actually caused the sun to rise from actually moving it. Now, I know for if you're if you are a new listener to the Midnight Ride, you might think we just fell off the banana boat. Well, it's been a few weeks before we fell off the banana boat. <laughs> and for those of you that do not take the book of Enoch seriously, you can uh, write us off if you want to. But careful, careful. There is so much that we have not been told. There's so much that we have been lied about that you need to study and pray to see what saith the word of God, because we have been fed a bill of goods over and over and over again, not only by our politicians, but by our educational facilities, and also by these so-called churches that are putting out their propaganda. Now let's go back to Enoch chapter 80, beginning in verse 3, and let's look at some more text in the book of Enoch that talks about the movement of these morning stars. And in those times, the fruits of the earth shall be backward and shall not grow in their time. What that is, that's famine. That's big time famine, and famine is coming. And the fruit of the trees shall be withered in their time, and the moon shall alter her order and not appear at her time. And in those days the sun shall not be seen, and he shall journey in the evening on the extremity of the great chariot in the west, and shall shine more brightly than accords with the order of light. And many chiefs of the stars shall transgress the order prescribed, and these shall alter, alter their orbits and tasks, and not appear at the seasons prescribed to them. And here again we address this in the cosmic boogie-woogie that not only... In the past, the morning stars rebelled. They were put in their place, but it is prophesied, not only in the book of Enoch, but in the doctrine of Christ, that there will once again be this cosmic disruption. And when this takes place, 
People are going to do one or two things. The Israel of God will lift up their head because we will understand what's happening. We will know that our redemption draweth nigh, but the kings and the mighty men of the earth, they're going to be looking for a hole to hide in. In verse 7, it says, And the whole order of the stars shall be concealed from the sinners. And people that do not have the Spirit of God, that are not going to believe the Word of God over NASA, and I'll just make it plain for you, if you believe the Word of God, and you go with sola scriptura, the Bible only, you are going to throw your spinning globe ball earth in the trash, and you're going to believe what the Word of God says. And that's such a huge step in believing God instead of the world, and that is a huge, and you know, the more I go, the older I get, and I'm getting old, let me tell you, the more I understand this is not just some secondary issue, but this is a primary understanding that opens up so many other truths in the Word of God that it's important. And just like the book of Enoch says, the whole order of the stars, the way our world is, it's concealed from the sinners, and it's a deliberate deception, and it's a deliberate corruption that's being forced upon us by the evil rulers of the world. Now, the true commander of the heavenly armies is Jesus Christ himself. In Colossians 1, 16 and 17, For by him were all things created that are in heaven and that are in earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers. All things were created by him and for him, and he is before all things, and by him all things consist. The reason the physical world functions as it does is because of Jesus Christ, who is the commander of the army of the Lord, literally the Lord of hosts. And this is the one that Joshua encountered when he brought the children of Israel into the promised land. In Joshua 5, it says, And he said, Nay, but as captain of the Lord am I now come. And Joshua fell on his face to the earth and did worship and said unto him, What saith my Lord unto his servant? And the captain of the Lord host said unto him, Joshua, loose thy shoe from off thy foot, and the place for the place whereon thou standest is holy. And Joshua did so. Jesus is the commander. God is in control. It is not the Luciferian dingbats that are running things. God is in control. Now, I want to read this passage in Isaiah 14. And like I say in Isaiah 14, these two entities, fallen entities, are addressed in the first half of the chapter. Lucifer is addressed, and in the second part, it is the Assyrian. And over and over again, the connection between the host of heaven and these entities and is emphasized. I want to read this, and I want to see how many times that the Lord referred to himself as the Lord of hosts, as the true commander of the heavenly armies. And the way that this worked, like we had a ride not long ago when we talked about Saturn being worshipped, and they had the understanding that when they worshipped Saturn, they were worshipping Cush, the father of Nimrod. And people had the understanding that they would worship the planet Venus, and they would understand that these heavenly luminaries corresponded to fallen entities. And the fallen entity associated with Venus was Lucifer. With Saturn, it was Cush, and so on. So in the worship of the heavens, and this was a way to veil it to a certain extent so that people, your neighbor, would know just all what you're doing, but the worship of the host of heaven, it's as old as paganism itself. And just look at this text, how repeatedly the Father refers to himself as the Lord of hosts in this chapter where he deals with Lucifer and the Assyrian. For I will rise against them, saith the Lord of hosts, and cut off from Babylon the name and remnant and son 
and nephew, even going to get your nephew, saith the Lord, I will also make it a possession for the bittern and pools of water, and I will sweep it with the besom of destruction, saith the Lord of hosts. And the Lord of hosts has sworn, saying, Surely as I have thought, so shall it come to pass, and as I have purposed, so shall it stand, that I will break the Assyrian in my land and upon my mountains, tread him underfoot, and then shall his yoke depart from off them and his burden depart from off their shoulders. This is the purpose that is purposed upon the whole earth, and this is the hand that is stretched out upon the nations for the Lord of hosts hath purposed, and who shall disannul it? We stand tonight serving the Lord of hosts. He is the victor. When we stand with him and we stand with truth, we win. And all the plans and the schemes of the evil conspirators, they are going to be judged. And when that judgment hits, it is going to hit like a whirlwind. In Daniel 2.21 it says of the Father, and he changeth the times and the seasons. He removeth kings and setteth up kings. He giveth wisdom unto the wise and knowledge to them that know understanding. It's the Father that has set the true seasons upon this earth. He's the one that will lift up kings and put down kings. And there's another one that is spoken of in Daniel 7.25, the beast that will come, and he shall speak great words against the Most High and shall wear out the saints of the Most High. Anybody getting weary out there? Yeah. And think to change times and laws. Now, this speaks to the exact season that we're in. God has given times and laws and yet many people would rather follow the Pope of Rome than the Word of God. They will follow the Pope of Rome in worshiping the goddess Ishtar on their pagan Easter rather than honoring God's times and seasons in Passover. This is just absolutely wrong. And I understand that this might be the first time you've heard it, but it's, it's not that hard. It is just really, really wrong. You'll either do what the Bible says, or you'll do something else. And it says, and this is absolutely one of the big parts of the beast system, because Easter is absolutely the worship of the goddess. And he shall think to change times and laws, and they shall be given into his hand until a time and times and dividing of times. Now, what this is spoken of in the word of God, when they would worship the host of heaven, and when they would determine their holy days by the movement of the heavenly luminaries, this was called being an observer of times. When you observe the heavens and you establish specific days on earth, and this is abomination to God. You know, we need to get this. This isn't just something that, you know, God might have a little problem with. This is abomination. Let's read what the Word of God says in Deuteronomy. And uh, for those of you that have been attending the dispensational church, if you just look at the end of the book of Deuteronomy, there's nothing that says that, you know, that book is going to expire. You know, obviously, when Jesus came, uh, he was the Lamb of God that took away the sin of the world, and those Levitical ordinances, thank God, were done away with. But the moral statements in God's moral law, they would never pass away, just like Jesus himself said. But in Deuteronomy 18, beginning in verse 9, When thou art come into the land which the Lord thy God giveth thee, thou shalt not learn to do after the abominations of those nations. And you see, the things that they're doing, you're not going to get them out of the word of God. You're going to have to learn it from paganism. There shall not be found among you anyone that maketh his son or daughter to pass through the fire, or which useth divination, or an observer of times, or an enchanter, or a witch, or a charmer, or a consulter with familiar spirits, or a wizard, or a necromancer, for all that do these things are an abomination unto the Lord. And because of these abominations, the Lord thy God doth drive them out from before thee. In the book of Leviticus 19, ye shall not eat anything with the blood, neither shall ye use enchantment, 
nor observe times. Observing of times is put there right with witchcraft and the eating of blood, right there in the Word of God. Now let's have a little comment here from one of our Puritan friends. Let's look at what Matthew Poole commented here on this text in the book of Leviticus chapter 19. And he said this, nor observe times, to wit superstitiously by the observation of the clouds or stars or otherwise, by esteeming some days lucky, others unlucky. And this is exactly what observing of times is. This is exactly how these dates for the pagan holidays are established, and it is abomination to God. You know, uh, it's abomination, you know, and we have to stand where God stands on this. It's something that people that are doing this, you need to repent, and you need to come back to the God of the Bible. You do not have to do what's wrong just because everyone else is doing it. You can stand with God, and you can stand with truth. Um, even it's just you and, and your dog or your cat. But I tell you what, you start standing up for truth, and the Lord is going to hook you up with some more people that are standing up for the truth. In Genesis chapter 1 and verse 14, And God said, let there be lights in the firmament of the heaven to divide the day from the night and let them be for signs and for seasons and for days and years. And these are the moeds, the times of God. And this is the very same word that is used uh, in the book of Leviticus for the biblical feast. And that's uh, another one of the reasons why that we are so strong on this issue, we will not do Easter. We will celebrate Passover, which was set in the Word of God. That's what the Word of God says. And once again, we're going to go back to our Puritan friend, Joseph Carl, and he has this comment on this text. He says, The course of times and seasons is firmly and inviolably settled by the commands of God. That's it. The course of times and seasons is firmly and inviolably settled by the commands of God. And the Lord spoke of what days were holy. He spoke of his Sabbaths. He spoke of his feasts. That's what we go by. We go by the Word of God, and we don't go uh, by the Roman Catholic Church or the so-called you know, and there is no Protestant church anymore. They used to speak of the Protestants because during the Protestant Reformation, they would protest and speak out against the heresies of the Church of Rome. Now they've become just like them, and nobody's protesting anything except not getting enough money in the offering. Now, in Revelation chapter 22 and verse 16, it says, and you see, we have to understand and not lose sight of the fact that Jesus Christ He's the true morning star. He's the true commander of the heavenly armies. God is in control. And though this rebellion will once again take place, and we're going to see this disruption, God is in control. And people that stay true to him and the Israel of God, we will persevere just like the children of Israel on that first Passover when they put the blood upon their doorpost and the death angel passed over. In Revelation chapter 22 and verse 16, I, Jesus, have sent mine angel to testify unto you these things in the churches. I am the root and the offspring of David, and the bright and morning star. And in this text, the morning star is nothing less than a title of deity for Jesus Christ. He's the offspring of David, the bright and morning star, one of the titles of his deity. And in the New International Virgin, Virgin, did I say New? <laughs> New International Version? No, we don't want to say that. <laughs> but in the New International Version, which is just about, and I tell you what, someone accused me of telling people they should throw their NIV Bibles away. I don't say that because the great tribulation is coming. You remember the toilet paper shortage during COVID? Well, let me tell you, Toilet paper is going to be hard to come by. Save that NIV Bible. It could come in very, very handy. And, uh, you know, 
that it, it, they're not adjectives enough for me to express the disgust that not only I have for this, but the Father and the Son and the Holy Ghost have for this. In Isaiah 14 and 12, what they do, they take the title of deity ascribed to Christ in the Scripture, and they ascribe it to his arch-rival, Lucifer, that tried to overthrow him as commander of as as the Lord of hosts. Let's read it. How have you fallen from heaven, morning star? This is the NIV. Son of the dawn, you have been cast down to the earth, you who once laid low the nations. We have to get back to the fear of God. Everything is presented to us in non-absolute form. There is no right, there is no wrong. It is wrong and it's abomination to God to observe times. It's wrong and it's abomination of God to take one of the titles of deity of Jesus Christ and ascribe it to Lucifer. This is rank abomination. And people today have, uh, I mean, it, it's just a joke. If you're in the 501c3 church, run for your life. Somebody said, are you actually saying that people that are in these modern churches should just absolutely leave? I said, you got it right. That's what I'm saying. Run for your life. Don't let the one foot, just put one little foot in front of the other and just keep going till you're out of there. It's bad. And it's too late to play games. It's too late to pull punches because this thing is winding down and uh, it's time to speak the truth unequivocally. And uh, truth is a lion. It will defend itself. In Isaiah chapter 14, 12, and we will revisit this scripture here. And we're going to make another connection in regard to the actual time frame of the setting up of the throne of Lucifer to the actual time when he had his, hill, his throne on the Mount of the Congregation and of the actual time when he was a breeder and wanted to fill the earth with his children. In Isaiah 14 and 12, How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? How art thou cut down to the ground, which didst weaken the nations? What nations? These were the nations of six-day man. And if that, and if you're not a listener of FOJC or the Midnight Ride, um, you probably don't understand that term. And we don't have enough time to bring you up to speed. I'd refer you to FOJC Radio to our Brideon channel and watch our Mysteries of Creation series. It, it blow a lot of things I say, blow people's mind, but I guarantee you we are not speaking off the top of her head. What we're saying here is being brought forth through a lot of prayer and a lot of study. But anyway, let's look at some comparisons here. And when we study the cherubim of Ezekiel chapter 28, and here again, there's nothing in the Word of God. Usually, all oh, the cherubim in Ezekiel 28, Oh, yeah, that's Lucifer. Yeah, Lucifer, Isaiah 14. Yeah, that's Satan too. Uh, Ezekiel 28. Oh, that's Satan. I tell you what, not one word in the Word of God backs that up. Not one word. Teach what's in the Bible instead of what's not in the Bible, and you're going to come to truth. Now, in Ezekiel 28 and 13, speaking to the, uh, the prince and the king of Tyrus, thou hast been in Eden in the garden of God, Every precious stone was thy covering, the sardius, topaz, and the diamond, the barrel, the onyx, and the jasper, the sapphire, the emerald, and the carbuncle, and gold. The workmanship of thy tabrets and of thy pipes was prepared in thee in the day that thou wast created. And in verse 16, and there it said that this cherub was in the Garden of Eden. Now here again, there's a disconnect there. And people, you know, they just, oh, we can't really believe that this anointed cherub was in the Garden of Eden. Now, that's what the Bible says. And it says, by the multitude of thy merchandise, they have filled the midst of thee with violence. And thou hast sinned, therefore will I cast thee as profane out of the mountain of God. What did Lucifer want to do? He wanted to ascend to the amount of congregation. And this is the actual earthly throne 
that Lucifer had established when he was a breeder in the days when, when the Garden of Eden was in existence, the nations of six-day man were upon the earth. Lucifer weakened them when he was cast down. It speaks of the anointed cherub in Ezekiel 28 of conducting merchandise and filling the earth with violence. And of the same time when Lucifer was cast down when he tried to ascend into heaven, the anointed cherub in Ezekiel 28 was cast out of the mountain of God. There's a complete teaching on the black cherub on um, FOJC if you want to check that out. It goes on to say, I will destroy thee, O covering cherub, from the midst of the stones of fire. And in 2 Samuel 5, 7, this will help us to understand exactly where the throne of Lucifer was on the Mount of the Congregation and the Mountain of God. And this is the same area today where we see the, the Temple Mount in Jerusalem. This is actually where this conflict was taking place. In 2 Samuel 5 and 7, nevertheless, David took the stronghold of Zion. The same is the city of David. And I'll read a comment here from Barnes' commentary on just exactly what we're talking about. And there's an there's a area of elevation here. And it says here in Barnes' commentary, the ancient Zion was the hill on which the temple stood, and the castle seems to have been immediately to the north of the temple. The modern Zion lies to the southwest of the temple. The name afterwards, the same as the city of David, the name afterwards given to it by which it was known in the writer's time. And this elevated area that is spoken of so much in the Word of God, that was so coveted and fought over by these ancient entities, this was the very area where Lucifer had his throne, and he wasn't even happy with that. He wanted to exalt himself into the third heaven to storm the very throne room of God. He was just all about his little self. Now, in 2 Kings 23 and 13, and the high places that were before Jerusalem, which were on the right hand of the Mount of Corruption, which Solomon, the king of Israel, had builded for Ashtoreth, the abomination of the Zidonians. Now, here we see, and you can even see this on some maps, and you will see it right out of the western gate of the temple. And on some of your Bible maps, you'll see right there, it'll say the Mount of Corruption. And this was literally the place where Solomon, and we know that Solomon took many pagan wives, and it was the custom of the wives that Solomon took that the firstborn child would be sacrificed unto the pagan deities, and it was all for Ashtoreth, the abomination of the Zidonians. This is another expression of the goddess worship. This is literally Lucifer worship, and the worship of Lucifer was, it just took over the nation of Israel in the days of Jezebel, and literally, you can document, we did another teaching called it the Lucifer children. They would actually impregnate little women with little babies. And according to the movement of the planet Venus, and they would sacrifice them. And it would go from, from Easter to Christmas. And there was exactly nine months there. And they were offered up, these little children were offered up in human sacrifice unto the goddess, unto Lucifer. This is the worship of Lucifer. This is the bloodline of Lucifer. We see it right here in the Word of God all through, whether it was Jezebel. And what did Jezebel have? She had the 400 and prophets of God that ate at her table. This was the 501c3 church of the goddess of Jezebel, people that would whore out the truth and not speak up and say the truth so they could get a few benefits from the government. This is just absolutely disgusting 
run for your life. And you know, people here again, boy, we're, oh, you shouldn't talk about 501c3 church. Well, I tell you what I'm going to do. I'm going to make it even harder because this is abomination to God. If you have any fear of God within you, you need to wake your little self up. And if you don't, just shut your little pie hole and stop trying to act like you're some kind of a warrior for God because you have sold it out. Ezekiel 28 and 18, For thou hast defiled thy sanctuaries by the multitude of thine iniquities, by the iniquity of thy traffic. Therefore will I bring forth a fire from the midst of thee. It shall devour thee, and I will bring thee to ashes upon the earth in the sight of all them that behold thee. Now the word of God says that this entity was in the Garden of Eden that it had traffic and filled the earth with violence, that it defiled sanctuaries upon the earth, and that this entity was brought down in front of the eyes of those that could behold its downfall. That's what the Word of God says. That's what I believe. In Ezekiel 31 and 16, this is speaking of the Assyrian who's addressed in the second part of Isaiah 14. I made the nations to shake at the sound of his fall. You cannot miss the connection. Isaiah 14, 12. How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning, which didst weaken the nations? The cherub in Ezekiel 28 brought down to the earth in front of people that beheld him, this entity that was in Eden. You read Ezekiel 31. The word of God says the Assyrian was in the Garden of Eden. You either believe it or you believe whatever people are going to make up and tell you. I made the nations to shake at the sound of his fall when I cast him down to hell with them that descend into the pit and all the trees of Eden, the choice and best of Lebanon, all that drink water shall be comforted in the nether parts of the earth. This shows us timing. This shows us the connection between what is spoken of in Isaiah 14 concerning Lucifer and Ezekiel 28 concerning the, the prince and the king of Tyrus, and in Ezekiel 31, what is spoken of the, the Assyrian, their judgment all took place at the same time, which would have been at the time of the fall of man when the judgment on the nations of six-day man took place. And with that, John... I'm going to quit. And I know that for new listeners, boy, we put a lot on you. And if you really want to study and find out what the Word of God says, there's much, much more teaching on all of the many aspects of this. But I think, John, for tonight, I think we're going to, we're going to stop it right here. All right. Sounds good, man. I, I just want to, you know, kind of just give a word out, too, real quick here at the end, because I think that a lot of times when people look at the stars and they look at all the mythologies, it gets really confusing. It gets really uh, worrisome because all of it sounds so similar to some of the things we see in the Bible. But the fact is the Bible is the correct record of what goes on in the sky. It's the correct record of the things that take place. Uh, we know through the scripture many, many times that it talks about the stars, just like David has shown here. Uh, you know, it talks about the order of the stars uh, being having to do with battle. Like in Judges 5.20, they fought from heaven. The stars in their courses fought against Caesarea or Sisera. And so in their courses, they literally fought against something in their courses. So meaning how they moved, manifested, mattered on earth. Um, and that, that is something to consider and to think about because when you look at the morning star, the, as the Bible says here, was it Matthew David, where it talks about um, him being the bright and morning star. Revelation, it says that I'm the root of offspring of David and the bright and morning star. The real bright and morning star is our king. He's the king. But, of course, every other religion has their own version of what they believe this to be or what they think this is going to be. And we know what it is. You know, that there's no there's no mistake in, when it comes to the Scripture and what all this stuff means. I mean... Um, when you look at the, the verse you quoted here, David, where it talks about Shamash and Asheroth, all of these are names of stars. You know, Shamath, a lot of uh, some people think that this is where we get our word Shekinah from, right? Where cherub and all of these different yeah. words. And if you know about Venus, Venus is called the Shekinah because it's supposedly a temple for the sun, the way it has two pillars because it comes up on one side, then it comes up on the other. 
uh, this is this is this temple for the sun, right? And so they've taken all of these meanings and they put a, a spin to it from the ones who are going to be destroyed. The spin is from the stars who are going to be destroyed by the Lord of hosts, and they put a spin to it. So if we can keep the Bible as our record, like David was saying earlier, then we can understand these things without being so confused, not understanding, because when you look at all the different mythologies, there's different names for each one because it's all different stuff, but you see these 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 stories. I mean, even in the Maseroth, the Bible talks about the Maseroth, the four cardinal points of the Maseroth are the same thing as the faces of the cherubs. You know, you have all of this stuff tied in together. It even talks about the end of the age in the scripture, which you, you gave a verse earlier where it says that the the sinners, their order will be, they won't even understand what's going on. And that's true today because how many times have you heard about the new age coming, right? But then there's times when people say it's here, it's going to be here, it's not here. We don't know when it's going to be because everything's lined up. They even built a temple uh, Rosalind Temple was built because they believed that the New Age was coming at that time, but it didn't happen, right? They're, the order's been concealed. And um, what a great show, David. I think people need to see this because it's easy to get sidetracked with all of that other stuff and lose, lose faith because you don't understand oh, yeah. that the Bible is also a book that talks about these things as well, but it talks about them in the correct way and yeah. that we can know that yeah. what it is, you know? And even the very word... Ashtoreth, it comes from the word aster, which means star. Yeah. The word for star. And literally, these are the star gods and the star goddesses. Yeah. Exactly what they are. Well, thank you, David. If you want to end us out, man, that was a great show. Make sure you guys all like it. Hit the like button. We're going to do pound the like button on the count of three. We call it the pounder's pound. David, count us off. One. Let's give it the pounder's Passover pound. Let's do that. There you go. One, One. Two, two, three. three. Boom. Awesome. Thank you guys so much. David, end us out. As always, I want to close the Midnight Ride out with heartfelt thanks to all of you that support the Midnight Ride, our listeners and our friends. A big thank you to each and every one of you because you love the truth and you're not afraid to go after it and to obey it. So until next Saturday night, 10 p.m. Central, high five and good night, everybody, from the Midnight Ride. And I stood upon the sand of the sea and saw a beast rise up, rise up, rise up.